everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Benjamin de Barra Sevilla. I'm a faculty member here, and I'm also part of the advisory board for uh, CAAD CAD, who is organizing today's uh, forum. So I have the privilege of welcoming all of you today, and also the privilege of introducing formally Patrick Danahi. So who is a, our lecturer and the 2023-2025 Emerging Scholar Design at the, at, the, at the School of Architecture, University of Texas at Austin. So I'm just going to go formally to introduce uh, Patrick so I don't take much of uh, his time because we are here to, uh, to listen to him. So Patrick holds a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from Clemson University where he received a graduating faculty award and the Peter Lee and Kenneth Rosso Award for Design Excellence. He later graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a Master's of Architecture, receiving the Cantor Trish Prize in Energy and Architectural Innova Innovation, the Paul Craig T-Square Fellowship, the Van Allen Traveling Fellowship, the Dales Fellowship, the Cohn Fellowship, the Schenck Woodman Merit Award, and upon graduating was awarded the Arthur Spade Brook Memorial Silver Medal. In 2022, he was selected as the distinguished professor leading the T40 Advanced Design Studio at Texas A&M University receiving the Best Design Studio Award and serving as the Design Innovation Fellow at Ball State University. He has taught several emerging media and digital technologies workshops, including the 2022 Arcadia Conference, the UCLA Bartlett RC20 Skills Share Program, the University of Kentucky, and the University of Pennsylvania. He has taught in several institutions, including design studios at Texas A&M, Ball State University, advanced design studios in the landscape architecture program at the University of Pennsylvania, and algorithm, al algorithmic design courses for the post-professional robotics and autonomous systems program at the University of Pennsylvania. His teaching focuses on computation and robotics integrating architectural references with emerging machine learning technologies. Patrick's research has been presented at international conferences, including the 2020 Digital Future Young Conference, Acadia Distributed Proximities, ICRA, Acadia Hybrids and Hasidics, Trades, Post-Digital Neobaroque, Sigradi and Kadria Post Carbon, where he received the award for Best Presentation Runner-Up with Robert Stuart Smith. His work has been exhibited internationally at the Venice Biennale and in galleries at the University of Innsbruck, Pratt, Ball State, <coughs> and the University of Pennsylvania. So help me welcome Patrick for his presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Benjamin. Um, and thanks, Alan, for the initial invitation and for CAD uh, for providing lunch and setting this up, um, and then for everyone uh, for joining. So uh, today I'm going to try and combine a couple of uh, previous research interests and my background in algorithmic design and machine learning, um, integrating that into architecture, but also uh, a kind of newer affinity for um, linguistic theory and language um, and how that might relate to uh, existing methods of historical cataloging in architecture. Cataloging has always been an integral part of architecture through the modes of observation, collection, analysis, and notation. It has been used to differentially compare things within sets and sets with other sets to finitely separate identity within the aesthetic arts, constructing language systems which simplify communication, something important in a field that requires a collective to achieve its final result. 
These catalogs at various points of history have acted as impositions, as analytical frames, or as cross-cultural comparisons. To amass data collections and develop systems for a more global common language seems to be a noble and useful task with the potential to make more potent the nuances of things around us. However, often in language systems, the need for digitalization or making discrete separations between characters within a notational system leads to reduction. This reduction often leads to oversimplification of things referred to, losing the nuanced traits of the thing during the translation process. We give up the particular relationships and qualities within things and between things for a standardized common language with with recent developments in machine learning, it seems that a variety of new models can augment our natural language systems, allowing for a much more nuanced type of classification and categorization. Our world is multifarious and complex. There is obvious value in reducing things for communication and to build mutual understanding. But my question in this talk is, when should this reduction happen, if it must? And what happens if machine learning models begin to delay this need for reduction? It, it may be time to reconsider some of the assumptions presented in linguistic theory, including ideas of interface, translation, meaning, and reduction. So first, I want to just uh, kind of isolate a few key points in history and the history of architecture um, and how we relate to the things around us or have. So the first point being uh, the idea of surveying. We are surrounded by fluid objects in our environment that operate as complex analog relational systems. Our tools for observation have always been systems of digitalization of the world around us, converting shifting planes into concise measured data points. This reduction and finite differentiation, combined with the unambiguity present in these observations, allows us to perform operations with this information and to collect common understandings of the discrete data points. In Languages of Art, Nelson Goodman uses the example of a clock face to articulate the difference between analog and digital systems. So not talking about computer versus drawing, things like that, but the actual idea of an analog versus uh, a system requiring digits. If the clock face contains hash marks that articulate finite and differentiated characters or regions of time within the face, then it is communicating to us a digital system of time, one that is notational and unambiguous, whereas a blank clock face that only registers the constant movement and exact position of the dial lacks semantic differentiation, making it an analog system. The benefits of the analog system are sensitivity and flexibility, whereas the digital system offers definiteness and repeatability. Our current tools for surveying accelerate the rate of capture and observation around us. We still translate our environment into a digital system with a finite differentiation of characters, allowing for repeatability and precision, but in its acceleration, it surpasses human, the human ability for interpretation. So we then have to make systems to decode this information. In the example of the clock face, the constant change in position of the dial and ambiguity of its measurement at any given time renders the precision of the system uninterpretable. We could articulate the time as 12-ish or 12-15-ish, but the dial is articulating an infinitesimally small measurement outside of our common language. This level of precision is near useless for communication of time and systems like this were nearly all disregarded until the invention of calculus, where mathematical operations dealing with rates of change entered our language and made interpretable these infinitesimally small differences. Historically, systems of notation have been established to allow for common language and communication. These notations have rendered operable the systems of surveying established. In this quote by Nelson Goodman, he articulates the usefulness of clear and concise <coughs> notational systems where the requirement of a notational system includes unambiguity, syntactic disjointness, syntactic differentiation, semantic disjointness, and semantic differentiation. So in other words, the things need to have clear and differentiated meaning, and then they need to be differentiated within a context um, and be unambiguous in their interpretation. 
to prescribe to Goodman's ideas of notational systems. So we see a few examples of these, uh, like in Euclid's optics and the, establish the establishment of notations on geometry, or Vitruvius's notations on drawing convention and projection, or Brunelleschi's uh, discovery of perspective and then the codification and establishment of notation systems surrounding it. And all of these become tools for us to uh, engage in communication within the discourse or within other uh, fields around these kind of codifications or notations. The output from any surveying system is a relatively dormant output until acted upon. Notational systems allow for common communication, which Goodman mentions is primarily through this idea of finite differentiation. So if something complies with a certain class and thereby is not something else, then it can be understood as that thing. In cataloging, we make these correlational pairings of things with common features, and then through differentiation, we extract unique identities of each set or each item in the set. Owen Jones did this uh, just as an example within the grammar of ornament, making cross-cultural comparisons of ornamentation systems. Uh, Augusta Choisy did this within his analytical drawing sets of ancient ruins. Um, and then a more contemporary version, Rem Kohlhaus does this with elemental uh, categorization in elements of architecture. Um, not necessarily a direct consequence of these prior uh, methods, but uh, a kind of later stage maybe in the process is this idea of ordering or kind of making sense of these collections and imposing uh, rule sets um, that determine a, a thing's <coughs> adherence to a certain compliance class. So if you do not do this, you are not this. If you don't fit in this uh, certain compliance class, you are not within uh, that particular order. Individual identity, uh, so this creates a prescriptive common identity which is easy but not individual. Individual identity, on the other hand, is not easy, as in easily communicated or established, but the analog systems allow for a much more nuanced and sensitive operation than overly, overly reductive or discrete ones. Uh, a further stage is a kind of ref um, reflection or looking back on some of these earlier ones, uh, like building up analytical frames, which involves determining whether an object exists within a given compliance class, rather than prescribing rules of whether something exists within that class. So one example of uh, an analytical frame is Heinrich Wolflin's uh, formal analysis <coughs> between the Renaissance and Baroque, two, two stylistic sets. Extending some of this work and connecting it into uh, these kind of contemporary tools of surveying, using LIDAR scanning, Andrew Saunders uh, extended this work, establishing high fidelity catalog of Baroque churches, allowing for more sensitive differentiation between the formal, compositional, and material aspects of these Baroque churches in Piedmont and Rome. <coughs> The representations are novel, but they stem uh, from or emulate earlier manual studies done by Luigi Moretti, who constructed plaster casts studying the interior volumes and sequences of spaces. One key difference between Andrew's and Moretti's sets is the higher order magnitude of data capture. So there's a simultaneity in Andrew's that is able to capture the kind of thin shell of painting and light and atmospheric conditions um, all collapse into the same representation as the formal. Although the form of the scans uh, that are captured are often familiar classes of objects, um, like calling something statue, a door, an interior, the surface of the 3D capture operates aesthetically almost like an analog watch face, reading as a continuous and an overly detailed description of the thing. Only through reduction, like imposing hash marks onto the watch face, can we make interpretable the data that lies dormant in the model. So we end up calling this a statue, uh, omitting a large amount of other much more nuanced classifications we could prescribe to this captured thing. 
Additionally, there's an understanding of uh, a kind of scan's continuity or this kind of thin shell or manifoldness of the scan. Um, there are maybe uh, kind of philosophical uh, analogies that I would like to make but would probably uh, be somewhat like misuse uh, relating to Tristan Garcia's idea of this kind of thin shell um, in the cast negative of an object relating to ontology. Um, but I think the, the kind of most apt comparison is maybe to early machine learning models used in architecture, like the style transfer model, where the continuity between features, although it's operating similar to a kind of collage-like system, mapping a feature of one image to a feature in another image, that continuity produced a seamlessness that uh, became almost un in, in, uninterpretable or difficult to interpret the differences between. Um, so on these scans, it, it may be slightly more semantically obvious what is a door or a window, but the actual kind of edge between them uh, becomes somewhat <coughs> difficult to differentiate. So we can then build up methods for understanding or differentiating um, and project that onto these scanned sets. One way that we can do this is just by collecting catalogs and then making uh, individual comparisons between these. So if we look at this slide, we all may likely register these as things within the compliance class statue, but when presented as a set, we should realize that that description statue allows for no differentiation between each one of these things and warrants additional labels. Within nuanced sets, we can use differentiation to fine tune our own aesthetic model and begin understanding the nuanced feature differences between objects in the set. So this is a kind of uh, different application, but Nelson Goodman talks about something I think uh, that can be read somewhat similarly relating to authenticity and forgeries. So he explains that al although there may not be a uh, a registrable difference between an original piece of artwork and its copy, it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a time that we better tune our aesthetic differentiation to be able to determine that difference. So over time, we may be able to differentiate it, and then knowing that these two things are different, there is still then aesthetic difference. Um, so this is a point that he makes uh, related to this idea of authenticity. But I think that also may apply uh, in whether or not we register all of the aesthetic differences in a set like this, um, and whether we kind of give ourselves the opportunity to at a later time, um, and how that relates to whether those exist dormantly in the set. The next method is through uh, disassembly, or a kind of myriology of parts. Um, allowing us to get into these models. So if we just take those familiar sets, disassemble them into blocks, and then reassemble them into new parts, um, these models, although composed only through a reassembly of those previous parts that we just saw, uh, I, I doubt fit within uh, in any of our minds in the compliance class statue. They exist somewhat ambiguously and kind of float away from direct interpretation. <coughs> or meaning. This type of ambiguous aesthetic operation um, can sometimes be disregarded because it's difficult to build up common languages of communication around, um, but I think this actually avoids a much more nuanced look at things like this, uh, so just because we don't have a name for them doesn't mean that they don't have particular values different than values in other systems. <coughs> Like the complex rate of change of things, uh, like the complex rate of change of things, which could have easily been disregarded in measurement systems prior to the invention of calculus, this type of ambiguous output may indicate a need for a much more nuanced system of operation or language relating to aesthetics. So a kind of uh, language based on a calculus for aesthetics, I guess. So, so far, uh, this has just been kind of building up the idea of uh, existing systems of codification, documentation, notation, imposition, and analysis. We're now in a moment 
where incredibly rich tools allow for a kind of simultaneous capture and collection of information, which happens at such a rate that we need advanced tools to decode that information. So advanced tools or systems for codification, notation, imposition, and analysis. This is where I think machine learning enters, building language systems from observations and collections of our environment, instilling digital operative, to operative systems within sometimes ambiguous analog systems. In 2023, uh, Stanislaus Shiloh wrote an article called uh, When Form Follows Meaning, AI's Semantic Turn in Architecture, where he draws the plans for a movement called semanticism within architecture. So this, this article uh, kind of, I think, fantastically presents the way that architecture has dealt with language and the way that it may uh, in relationship to machine learning models um, and their kind of affordances. Um, and he establishes these kind of five points uh, of that. So I won't read these, but basically saying that the way in which machine learning models or especially diffusion and natural <coughs> language models, uh, the kind of newer and most popular ones, deal with the idea of semantics is somewhat similar to the idea of signification in architecture. The, the point that I would uh, like to differentiate my work from what Stanislaus is saying in this article um, is the reliance on this semantic meaning. Um, I think this kind of reliance ends up in pointing to something of reducing our references and not really fully interpreting uh, the dormant qualities of the things around us, which I think machine learning models actually give us access to, uh, a kind of regained access to that, maybe. One issue in these machine learning models is uh, they have a kind of uh, maybe difficulty to produce novelty. Um, so they're trained to replicate based on certain given inputs. Um, so if we ask it to produce an elephant, it gives us a kind of semantically defined image of an elephant. <clears throat> um, but this is not necessarily expressing the idea of an elephant. It's not necessarily going beyond whatever it was given or some amalgamation of what it is given. Um, so the kind of semantic reduction of the image as an elephant stays as this kind of concept in our minds. Um, and we don't necessarily need to look in the image further. One way that we can avoid this is through the use of contradiction. Um, so we can take this kind of semantic embedding into these models and then use contradictory positions to create what Nelson Goodman calls vacant semantics uh, or a vacant meaning um, or a kind of null de denotation. So um, maybe better expressed in an image. So. Goodman says that in object English, though the predicate green and the predicate horse do have compliance, green horse collectively does not. Um, so inscriptions without compliance, which are called vacant, lack semantic <coughs> meaning, but not syntactic meaning. They exist within the kind of language system. Um, so this is able to be produced in this model, although the model hasn't necessarily been trained on purple elephants. It's just making a substitution of one property in the class elephant. A uh, cuter example, um, but one that gets at the issue a bit deeper of how we can operate within these models is an idea of prompting for something like dog elephant. So an elephant does have a property, which is gray or brown, that can be easily substituted for another color property, purple. Um, and that can be placed on that kind of known class elephant. But the class of dog and elephant exist at the same level. Um, so in order to produce this, it needs to combine the kind of form of both and create an emergence of properties of, of both. So it, it neither directly fits into one compliance class or the other, but it's a kind of mixture of both of them. And this gets at a kind of morphogenetic process, which creates novelty. Um, so this image didn't exist in the inputs that the model was trained on. Um, but it's through that kind of contradiction that we can get at this type of output. 
Another affordance of um, most machine learning models um, is this kind of relooking our naive view uh, where the value in strangeness, vagueness, and ambiguity um, grants us the ability to look twice and remove our kind of semantic baggage. So it allows for individual interpretation, but uh, it still kind of retains this operative quality. It's still a language system, but it allows for flexibility or ambiguity within it. So these Jane Bennett and Vibrant Matter um, is essentially calling us to consider this type of idea. Uh, so the idea of non-identity or removing our, our concepts, our conceptualizations, <coughs> um, which act to kind of reduce a thing, and instead to look deeper or closer into that thing, um, potentially allowing us to access a, a more nuanced uh, look at its qualitative moments, is what she says. Nelson Goodman echoes this same sentiment, suggesting that removing the baggage that we assign to semantically differentiated things may allow for a fresh look at the thing that we are seeing. <coughs> so he calls this the innocence of the eye. He then later says that the innocence of the eye can't exist for humans um, because we all bring our semantic baggage to the, the foreground. So we all have this tendency to prescribe certain concepts or reduced ideas of something instead of looking closely or specifically at a particular thing. But machine learning allows for this kind of innocence of the eye. So we don't have to prescribe the semantic meaning onto the thing, and it can look kind of freely from this. So in this exercise, just to illustrate the idea, um, this is a, a kind of super early machine learning uh, exercise with the SYNGAN, or Single Natural Image GAN model. Um, so in this image, the model is learning one particular image and all of its different scale of features. So when we extract a part of the image and then allow this model to regenerate these parts, it doesn't necessarily know or care about these kind of uh, different positions or semantic separations of face, arm, shoulder, back, whatever we might read it as. And instead, it replicates all of the features that can be projected back into the original image. So what we end up getting is these kind of smaller scale features that are familiar, recognizable, fit within the image. Um, but the, what was this kind of head or facial hair or arm or shoulder starts to kind of bleed into one another. So we lose the meaning. Uh, we still have the kind of aesthetic information. This is an idea that um, I'm still kind of <coughs> trying to work on uh, among all of these other notions as I'm piecing them together. But this idea of semantic loss um, and how this might actually afford an opportunity to look deeper into things, um, unpack our own kind of baggage. So if we take an image, it has a registerable, registerable identity as a whole, a semantic meaning. As soon as we start breaking up that image, it starts to lose a layer of that semantic meaning uh, and kind of decontextualize. And then as we extract each of the parts, especially with their kind of... Uh, loss of resolution, the pixel starts to blur that meaning even more, and we no longer kind of retain this part within its relationship to the whole image, uh, that, that meaning <laughs> present within it. As we scale the part back down, then that kind of resolution or, or scale of the pixel gets reduced to a point where our eye no longer reads it, and we actually start to kind of uh, maybe see a little bit more or a hint of something more in this image uh, than the kind of previous sets because we were registering the pixel disproportionately weighted to the content in the image. So this is a, a kind of visual or aesthetic exercise um, that I started working with it, with machine learning models. Um, kind of, I'll, I'll call it for now like this but that, but it's operating on these ideas of substitution of image parts. So you have a registerable image, a facade, and in this image, parts of it have been removed, and the remaining parts have been asked to ca carry the perceptual weight 
of the rest of the image. So on the bottom row, um, if you look closely, there's a few tiles that have had to be duplicated um, to carry the kind of perceptual weight of the rest of the image. And as we remove more, we lose some more of that kind of semantic clarity, but each remaining piece carries the perceptual load of all of the missing parts. Until you're left with 20 unique tiles, which have a kind of uh, idea of efficiency of aesthetics or efficiency of parts to carry the perceptual load of the original image, but we're not necessarily regarding the semantic clarity of the original image. So it still has the properties without the meaning. Um, and then we can do this exercise again, but using uh, these kind of methods of image compression to uh, non-uniformly subdivide the image into hierarchical parts, so smaller tiles. And as we do this, it delays the kind of loss of semantic information. Um, so we're still reducing the parts. There's still, the machine learning model is what's operating to kind of try to maintain the image's perceptual similarity. Um, but it doesn't have a semantic filter, so it's not necessarily trying to preserve uh, what is a door. It's trying to preserve the kind of aesthetic qualities of a door. We can do this by structuring new language systems. So with machine learning models, we, we can structure the actual model or architecture of the model to allow us to operate, uh, so still perform something that is measured, precise, and communicable um, mathematically, but doesn't necessarily have this kind of meaning embedded in it. So in this example, the, the previous ones I just showed, and the ones I'll show in the slides uh, that I'll show shortly, I'm using the learned perceptual image patch similarity architecture, um, which basically just it embeds these kind of feature scales of an image, so a zoom in, a middle scale, and then a zoom out. Uh, you can think of it as, um, and it tests the similarity between two images. So there's no classification, there's no knowledge of what is in the image, just looking at pixels and determining composition, color, related to human perception. So this type of model can do the sorting for us, detached from semantic meaning. So aesthetic sorting without, or perceptual sorting without uh, aesthetic, or sorry, semantic meaning or classification. Um, so then to be deployed, we can deploy this in uh, the kind of idea of a metaphor, where in this example by Ben Marcus's age, or by Ben Marcus in the age of wire and string, the terms are all familiar, they all retain their own semantic meaning, but when cast into new relationships, that original meaning is lost. So the brother is built from food. I know what brother is, I know what food is, I know what built is, but as they all get strung together, in this kind of uh, what Ian Bogos calls a metaphorical daisy chain, we, we start to lose that original semantic information and it actually forces us to look closer at the relationships of what we thought was known. Um, I think this directly relates to what Jane Bennett's talking about in this idea of uh, the kind of cure for the hubris of conceptualization in non-identity and allowing us to have a closer look at the nuances of things. So to do this in images, we can take a known image, substitute for uh, another image's parts, and we start to make these adjustments of paradigmatic parts of one image to the syntagmatic positions in another image. So this is uh, this like that, casting these kind of image-based metaphors from one image to another, which is somewhat similar um, in how the early style transfer models work. But each of the parts or each of the tiles operate discreetly um, so that we can actually impose specific registrations of parts rather than the continuity that was present in those early style transfer models. I think some of the successes personally for me uh, on these models, um, whether done with images or with 3D scans and then produced in these kind of relief sets, is the ambiguity between the, the tiles where the tiles start to actually read as figures or a larger kind of territorialized clusters um, rather than individual pieces. So the last 
thing that I'm going to show uh, is an older study in machine learning that was done in my uh, master's thesis, um, which uses generative adversarial networks and the latent space within them uh, to try to perform this kind of aesthetic calculus, so a mathematical operation outside of meaning that still gets at the kind of hidden aesthetic qualities of things. Um, so it started with traveling and collecting of 3D scans, images, and data from one particular stylistic set within architecture, the Art Nouveau. Um, after this collection, uh, these were then translated into image sets and three-dimensional sets, but I'm just going to focus on the progression of image sets. Um, so within these sets, the, the kind of scale or uh, content within it wasn't considered. Instead, it was just the kind of pixel arrangement, color features, uh, the kind of aesthetic qualities of these things, which were then fed into <coughs> this generative adversarial network, which is two models, one learning to fake an image, uh, one learning to determine whether uh, the images are fake or not. And then within this model training process, we get uh, a kind of mathematical operative system that we can work within. Um, so when I first started, there were no open source models of these uh, available. So I wrote my own from scratch, uh, which just looked at totally unsupervised. I gave no input. I just threw in the images. And it looked at all of the images and produced these fuzzy, vague readings of the original. Um, and you got something like this, where it could fluidly move between the kind of aesthetic features or uh, classifications without the kind of separate classifications that we usually impose on things. So this is a kind of example output from those early models, which again have this kind of vague fuzziness present in them. Um, but I think there's something even in the vague fuzziness keeping it away from this kind of semantic positioning um, that is actually, I think, beneficial. The operative portion of these early models um, that I think is useful in understanding is that we can operate mathematically on the images themselves because of the way that the model has trained. So the, the model is storing this kind of latent or dormant information within a hyperdimensional space, so a 512 dimensional space. And within that space, um, we can perform mathematical operations. So we can take like domains or groupings of images. Um, the most famous example is a StyleGAN model which trained on celebrity faces. And you can embed in uh, the, the model itself this notion of wearing glasses or uh, smiling, and you can make subtractions, additions, averages of these kind of aesthetic features without directly ever making the classification. So in the bottom is just, uh, you have image A, image B, you can add them and you get image D. Uh, you can add those plus another one and get uh, image E and then image F. But these are all just mathematical operations operating in images. So at a kind of uh, better scale, using an open source model, StyleGAN2, um, you start to get a closer look at the kind of sensibilities or nuances of uh, details or features of the Art Nouveau. Still blurry, but this is because it's from years ago, so it doesn't have the kind of fidelity of uh, current models. But I think somewhere in here in the loss of semantic information is actually a, a kind of aesthetic power. And then these are some of the outputs. And this ended up being translated into a web app that I built for uh, general use by the public, where people could upload images within the set. In this example, it's William Morris's wallpaper sets. Um, and images from William Morris's wallpaper sets are being uploaded to the model. and added, subtracted, averaged, multiplied, um, and ra ra random Gaussian walks are being produced from it. Um, basically meaning I can know nothing about the kind of floral content of William Morris's sets or how he created it, but I can perform these kind of mathematical operations and communicate this directly with someone else um, without having the kind of baggage associated with uh, any of my contextual information relating to 
uh, William Morris or the work. So to close it out, um, I, I think there's an opportunity in cataloging the sets that, that we don't need to restrict or impose restrictions relating to semantic information or reduction. Um, we have previously used those to make clear the communication of things, um, but I think this actually keeps us from looking a little bit deeper into the nuances of the aesthetic relationships between things. Uh, another potential benefit is that we're taking some kind of aesthetic understanding of familiarity or perception and then replacing this into a model which can automate that process to some degree. Um, if we can understand that relationship well, then we can use this to drive automation for robotic fabrication or other processes like this. Um, I have a few papers that start to speculate on that um, using computer vision, other machine learning models combined with robotic processes for like uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Um, but I think the most significant thing is this idea that we don't have to rely on prescri prescriptive classification systems um, and instead can still build language systems using machine learning um, that starts to tie into deeper aesthetic uh, categorization. So I now have time for questions. I know that that's uh, a dense set of slides. Uh, I, they're half-formed opinions. Um, and, and kind of research that's still being processed. Um, but that's where I'm at. <laughs>